Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 142 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Giltaka. Thanks for joining me again. Today on the show, we've got a ton of stuff to talk about. You know, these liberals never rest, uh, along with their henchmen, the NDP and the Bloc Québécois. Uh, so we've got new amendments and regulations to talk about with uh, associated with Bill C-21 and some policies, too. Uh, we, have, uh, we have had our hearing in CCFR versus Canada and uh, eight days worth. So Tracy's got some uh, some stories and some things to talk about there to uh, to report. And the CSAAA. Uh, strike a, uh, a actual written contract to participate in a gun buyback for retailers, importers, and distributors, and uh, so that that got that's a pretty sensitive thing going on in our community right now. So we've got uh, we've got some thoughts to share with you on that. Uh, so all that and more uh, will be on the show today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank some of the businesses that are supporting the CCFR Radio Podcast. Bullseye North stocks a wide variety of guns, ammo, optics, knives, and accessories from all the big brands and offers free shipping nationwide on orders over $200. Some conditions apply. Sign up for their weekly newsletter to get zeroed in on their weekly deals and live inventory. Bullseye North is your sports shooting superstore. A huge thank you goes out to our great friends over at the Saskatchewan Rivers Chapter of Safari Club International. They do a lot of great work over there, including supporting the CCFR and the CCFR radio podcast. Check out all their great work at saskriversci.com. That's saskriversci.com. CTOMS has been a provider of trauma care training to military and police in Canada for nearly two decades. Now this emergency medical training is being made available to a wider audience through CTOMS Academy online courses. This online training is valuable to anyone that pursues sporting or outdoor activities or finds value in being prepared for a crisis. Visit ctomsacademy.skillbuilder.co and use promo code CCFR30 for a 30% discount on all training. And thank you so much to our great friends over at Vortex Canada. They continue to support the CCFR podcast and the CCFR. Can't say enough about them. Check out all their great products at vortexcanada.net. That's vortexcanada.net. Vortex, the force of optics. All righty then, we are back. So um, you probably noticed we have a new sponsor. So thanks again to everyone over at Bullseye North for helping us keep this podcast going. Really, really appreciate the help. Okay. Um, I've only got one thing I want to go over with you, uh, two things in the podcast. So one I'm going to talk about now, one I'm going to talk about in the outro. So um, let's talk about that first. So in the outro, um, I'm going to explain my answer for why anyone needs an AR-15. And why am I doing that now? It's like, haven't we beat that to death? It's like, well, <laughs> apparently not everyone is tired of asking that question because I had to answer it yet again with media, right? So we did a little bit of media, Tracy and I both, I think maybe 10 or 12 media appearances, different things, radio, TV, whatever, right? Online uh, over these uh, these uh, Bill C-21 announcements. And inevitably, someone says to me, <laughs> I always remember the guy from the CBC, the the best. If I don't know if you guys, it, I'm going to describe this for you just for fun. I, I didn't plan to do this, but um, I'm going to describe for you that the CBC appearance that I had. I don't know if you if you saw it, you'll know it, right? Because the guy, I can't remember his name, but it it's um, it's online, and I think I was at uh, International Shooting Supplies. I was getting filmed, and this guy's in his office, and you see him on camera too. And he's like, "Why would anybody need an AR-15 like this?" <laughs> and I can see him because when they do that, like they put. Um, they put them on the phone and the cameraman's, you know, holding the phone in front of you. So you sort of see them. And so you can kind of get the questions, get that, that vibe, right? Like you're talking to a person. And I was like, are they going to put that on TV? And then they, they did. So anyway, someone asked me, why does anyone need an AR-15? It's a lazy question, but it gets asked um, from an innocent perspective quite a bit. I'm going to, like, I, I have, I've explained this many times. But I've come up with a very condensed explanation uh, for people. And usually when I'm talking 
Um, it's, it's off. Like I, I don't use scripted answers, right? Like I talk off the cuff. I speak from the heart. It's always, it's always different the way that I phrase things. Sometimes it's, it's better. Sometimes it's worse. Depends if I'm caffeinated or tired or whatever, right? If my brain's like a baked potato after, you know, yapping for all day. Um, but anyway, I actually jotted down the, the thoughts in order so that I could pass them on to you. And, and maybe that would help you explain that to somebody else. So I'm going to do that in the outro. Okay. So stay tuned for that. Now, um, what I wanted to go over with you before I bring Tracy on is I've got a clip. And this is from SECI, right? The Public Safety Committee, the one that is debating um, or examining Bill C-21 and its amendments, right? And this one comes from our friend, Christina Michaud um, from the Bloc Québécois. And, uh, you know, it's it, the reason I'm going to show you this clip, and it's, again, not to get you wound up, it's just... If we don't show you what goes on there, no one else will. Like the, the mainstream media won't show you the absolute circus, you know, bowling pin juggling buffoonery that goes on um, with certain politicians on certain committees within government in general. Like it's just, you know, they're dealing with very serious things. We take it very seriously. But it's, it's you'd think that after, you'd think that, after all these committees, after all this expert testimony, and and you'd think that they would be interested in what the truth really is, right? Like, you know, who's? it seems like there's different stories. Well, somebody's got to be right, no? So anyway, you'd think that they would learn something after all this. So anyway, here's Christina Michaud. They, um, they've introduced this new definition of assault, apparently assault-style weapons, right? And it's centerfire semi-automatic firearms with a detachable magazine that... Originally, we're, we're designed to contain more than six cartridges, I think, is what it is. We'll, we'll go through all that stuff with Tracy. Um, but anyway, it's, it's virtually the same definition as you saw previously in uh, Amendment G4. So what you're going to see is Christina showed uh, afraid and concerned with how this uh, um, definition may affect firearms in Canada and what might happen as a result. Anyway, check out the, uh, the clip and we'll talk about it in a second. I also have a question about uh, point 2i, article 2, has been developed initially with a detachable cartridge for six magazines uh, or more. We are concerned about that insofar as we're afraid that uh, fab manufacturers might easily be able to circumvent that regulation. For example, a manufacturer might be able to market a weapon with a cartridge that would be limited to five magazines, but would nothing would prevent them from commercialising that same weapon in the United States, for example, where they'd be able to do so with uh, high capacity cartridges such as 20 or 30 magazines and therefore they would filter back into Canada illegally through the black market and uh, wrongdoers would be able to use those and attach them to a legal weapon here in Canada. So I'm wondering, by including in the definition initially designed to, et cetera, et cetera, I don't know if I'm being clear in my remarks here, but does that open the door to circumventing, manu manufacturers circumventing this definition? Wouldn't it be better off for us to say uh, a cartridge that would uh, have a limited capacity of six magazines? I don't know if my question's clear. Okay, let me get this straight. Actually, before we do that, Let's give Christina the benefit of the doubt that it is the translator that doesn't know the difference um, between a magazine and a cartridge. I doubt it because these translators are pretty good. I think there's a distinct possibility that Christina doesn't know the difference at this point between a cartridge and a magazine. And so if that's the case, this whole thing looks even worse. So anyway, let me get this straight. Her and the Bloc Québécois are equal parts concerned and afraid that the loose language in this amendment will lead to Canadian manufacturers, of which there's only a handful, and whatever, you know, we could, because our, our firearm market is about equivalent to one of the smaller states in the United States, our whole country. One of these, one of these manufacturers are going to commercialize one of their guns, their antiquated AR-180 designs, because we can't have ARs anymore, 
are going to sell it to the United States that have 400 million, half a billion guns in circulation, and they are the by far the largest manufacturer of firearms on the face of the planet Earth. Remember planet Earth, Christina? Yeah, well, in that on that planet, the biggest manufacturer is just south of us. It's the United States. They're going to be interested in our weird guns with the long barrels and all the weird stuff for the, from the regulations. They're going to be interested in that. Then they're going to export these guns because they don't remember, they don't, they don't have any guns over there. They're going to pair it up with the standard capacity magazine, okay, because... Anything over five rounds, these people call a high capacity magazine. They're just standard, 20 to 30 rounds, depending on the firearm. Anyway, you'd think that they would know any of the, some of this stuff by now, right? And then they're going to smuggle it back into Canada and insert it into the black market where someone's going to buy it and misuse it. Like, is that, is that, is that what you're asking? So the reason why that's so distressing is, you know, those meetings are probably $50,000 a meeting. Like I was there, right? I've been there before a couple of times. And it's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of people there. And a lot of people making a lot of money. A $50,000 meeting, at least, I would imagine. And how many meetings have they had on this bill? Like stinking 30? And by now, and remember, when, when experts fly across the country like me and show up and be like, hey, you know what? This isn't the, the place for any ridiculous online stuff. We're here. This is serious business. This is about gun bans and public safety. And Christina Michaud, along with Talib Nur Mohammed, <laughs> that little guy, and, and Pam Damoff, they want to talk about mean tweets, right? They want to just sit there and try to discredit you as if I don't know anything about firearms or something. I have no reason to be there, right? So when they had those chances, no, no, they want to talk about mean tweets. And then when the experts are gone, they're, they're saying stuff like that, like this. You know, apparently they're, they're experts in the United States, right? They're, oh, you know, you just shoot anybody you want in the United States. There's no laws. Everybody's got guns, even babies, whatever. We don't want to be the United States, NRA this, NRA, NRA style that, NRA inspired. Well, for experts in the United States, they sure don't know a darn thing now, do they? So anyway, just the reason why I'm, I'm showing you this clip is just you can see just the level of absurd circus-like buffoonery that goes on there, like bears riding bicycles and people, you know, juggling bowling pins, you know, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I take this stuff very seriously. I take public safety seriously for a number of reasons. And it's just, these people want you to, to interact with them as if they're serious people, right? And which I did. I went there and said, oh, I'm not mess around with online stuff. This is, this is serious stuff. We're here to deal with public safety or the confiscation of property from millions of Canadians. And it's like, they're not serious people. They're ideologues. They're activists sitting there drawing huge money from the taxpayer. And then just, they're, are they, I don't even think they listen to anything. Because if Christina, after all this time, even on her own volition, she should be figuring out what a cartridge is or a magazine or is there, are there a lot of guns in the United States? Would they be interested in even um, importing our guns? You know, just like anything. Like you'd think they would know even the basic, any basic amount, or they'd be interested to learn it themselves if they just couldn't learn it from experts, like I said, that would fly across the country to be at their disposal to help them. So anyway, this is uh, not unusual in the uh, the liberal NDP government. And when you have the Bloc Québécois kicking in a few... Uh, a few little uh, tidbits of knowledge uh, as well. Anyway, hopefully <laughs> you don't get too torqued up about that. Hopefully you can just look at it as kind of morbid humor. It's like you almost have to laugh at these people. They're so ridiculous. So anyway, I thought it was interesting. I, as soon as I saw it when I was watching the, the Seki hearings, I'm like, I'm clipping that. That's going on the podcast and the TV show, by the way. So anyway, um, enough of my babbling. Uh, I'll have more to say at the end in the outro. Let's bring Tracy on. All right, via Skype, we've got Tracy Wilson of the CCFR. Wilson! <laughs> Giltaka! <laughs> What's a good word? Oh, just a, a lot going on. Like, I, we keep saying that we're going to try and have some light duty, but there will be no opportunity for that. Yeah, you know what? Oddly enough, I'll just I'll tell this little anecdote. It's kind of funny. <laughs> I don't know if I talked about this in the last, um, in the last podcast or last TV show, or I just told you about it, but... You know, we had talked like weeks, ago, weeks and weeks ago. I'm like, I'm burning out. I need, 
I need to take a week and just do light duty, right? That was the whole yeah. the whole idea. And then when that week came, um, every time my wife asked me to do something, I would just yell light duty at her <laughs> in order to just keep duty. doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try that. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure it works. But um, anyway, <laughs> all right. We've got a lot to cover, so we'll get started. First thing is uh, we had our hearing. Uh, mm -hmm. CCFR versus Canada was, um, it wasn't eight days, but it was, it, it equated to two weeks. Um, so anyway, yes. you, I guess the easiest way to kind of launch into this is we'll talk about your transcript because you were present every day in the courtroom. The CCFR mm -hmm. made you available to do that as a service to our members. And yeah. you live tweeted, uh, the entire, your, your, your interpretation of the entire trial the whole time. Yeah, that's right. So we were able to provide to the public who wanted to watch via webcast, you could watch that. But of course, you can't record it and play it later. It's not like SECU where if you're at work during the day and you miss a SECU meeting, you can always catch it later on the CCFR's YouTube channel. Well, we don't have that opportunity because it's not legal to record and broadcast uh, court hearings. So the only way we could sort of get like a real time tangible record of it until the transcripts come in, the official transcripts, was for me to sit there and live tweet the whole thing, um, which, of course, we turned into a web story. And it's a bit of a long read, but I know a lot of people have been reading it. It's available at CCFR.ca. It's up there. And it's exactly that. It's my interpretation of what was happening. I put a chart describing all the acronyms that I used and, of course, a chart with everyone's last name because I only referred to people um, with their last name and you need to know who they who they are, right, who's on whose side. So, yeah, quite the experience and just really long. I'm telling you, I was grateful to get out of there each day. I was getting cramped hands and a sore butt from the hard chairs. But, uh, yeah, it was just a really interesting experience, and it was neat to interact with all the legal teams. So, so yeah, really good. I liked it. Yeah, so speaking specifically about your transcript, it's available on firearmrights.ca. Yeah. You've turned it into a is, – is there a PDF version for download? Uh, no, I put it – I could, though, but I, I basically just – you know, it's just a whole bunch of text. But it is divided by day. And sort of topic, right? Because one day it would be like, you know, the liberal government lawyers respond. Today, our lawyers respond. So, you know, it's broken down by day and topic so that you can get the flow of it. But, yeah, it's a short novel and it'll be a heck of a lot of an easier read than reading the official court transcripts, which are coming. Um, but, it, you know, it's in a little bit plainer language than word for word lawyer talk, right? Right. So, um, yeah. so anyway, that's up on firearmrights.ca. It's, I think someone read it and said it was what, an hour and a half's read? Yeah. It took them about an hour and a half to read through it, okay. which, you know, I mean, is not so bad considering this was eight, eight days of, of talking, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's whittled down and of course a, an entire paragraph of talking is put into a sentence. So, yeah, I I think people are appreciating it. It's basically that's what we've got for now, and it is like a retelling, like a storytelling of what happened. So right, so yeah. um, so that's available, and um, we'll also so there's going to be an update coming to PropertyJustice.ca because we haven't updated that in a while, and yeah. that's a one one stop repository for everything around the case. Um, we're yep. also going to secure the transcripts for the case, which should be around $20,000 for all the transcripts. But, um, you know, we think that it's really important for our members and everyone who supported the case to to have an actual transcript. Uh, like I said, it's it's not cheap um, to, to, to own those, uh, but we'll make those publicly available on, um, on propertyjustice.ca when we get them, and we'll make them downloadable yep. as well. Uh, so you can download the actual file. You don't have to cut and paste from the website. And then maybe we'll make a PDF version of your play-by-play -play and put that on propertyjustice.ca. Give us a few weeks for that because we're still kind of inundated with all kinds of things like the new amendments in Bill C-21, which we'll talk about in a second and, and whatnot. But uh, eventually in the next, like I said, a couple, next few weeks, all that stuff will be on propertyjustice.ca. So it, why don't we close out this topic by you just talking about your your couple of favorite stories from the from the, uh, the yeah trial. okay 
Yeah. Well, probably my most favorite part of all, I call it the deconstruction of Najma Ahmed. So you may remember she's the head of um, a lobby group formed by doctors, uh, Canadian doctors for protection against guns or something. Um, And it's interesting because, of course, she's, you know, really, really proud of her own self. And it's been um, interesting to watch her in the media. But we had Sarah Miller from JSS, which is our legal team, just do a perfect deconstruction of her. The liberals lawyers really spent a lot of time sort of trying to attack the credibility of some of the witnesses, expert witnesses on our side. And they particularly picked on Kaylin Langman, who is an ER doctor who also does a lot of really specialized research. He's got published peer reviewed studies on, you know, the effects of gun legislation against homicide or suicide or against mass shootings. Right. So he's pretty much the only person in Canada who's got that type of research. And they were like, well, you know, he's biased. However, they put forward Najma Ahmed as their star, you know, academic witness, which is interesting because she literally has a registered federal lobby group, like not just an advocacy group or a Facebook group. It's literally a registered federal lobby group. So she's got an obligation to her organization and to her members or supporters to advocate for gun bans. So how can you possibly be part of a lobby group and also say that you're not biased, right? Langman isn't part of any group. He's an independent researcher. Um, you know, he's, it's funny. The, the judge even said, well, wouldn't Dr. Najma um, know about this kind of stuff because she repairs bullet wounds or works on people with bullet wounds uh, because she's an ER doctor. And Sarah Miller was like, and so is Dr. Langman. He just also happens to be the most preeminent published academic researcher on this on this topic so the judge is like oh right okay so yeah it was just it's just kind of funny because she wasn't even there and she was just completely deconstructed by sarah miller and then my other favorite moment was a very worried crown council so i did notice sitting about five rows behind them that they were following my twitter feed but more interestingly it happened on both the second last day and the very last day the McKinnon, who was like the team lead on the government's lawyer, their their whole legal team, he approached the judge and basically said, you know, if you don't throw out these cases and you come back with a ruling, basically, if it's against us, are we going to have an opportunity to discuss it with you? Because there may be an impact on other legislation, because, of course, you'd have case precedents, Right. So I went for a drink after the, um, I think it was the final day or the second last day with uh, some of our legal team. And I asked, like, so what was that about? I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but just, you know, I, I kind of know what's going on. And from where I was sitting, it really seemed like he was preparing to lose and was really concerned about what the impacts of that loss would be on other OICs, like, let's say, a handgun freeze. And um, she said, yeah, that's exactly what that was about. So if they are going to come back and rule again against them and for us. He wants to know so that they can, you know, mitigate the other damage created by that. And I was like, oh, that's pretty spicy. So, yeah, those are kind of my two favorite moments out of the whole thing. But, um, um, yeah, I, I think our team did great. All the teams did really great. Christine Jenner, the self-rep, was just a, a rock star. She really poured a lot into it. She's happy to have her life back now. And now we wait for a decision. Yeah, it might be yeah. a it might be a while before that shows up. Uh, yeah. The process is uh, is slow, um, but from what we've been told, a decision could take between two and six months. So we've been yeah. kind of kicking around three months, around three or four months, uh, but it could take up to six months. And I would I would imagine now this is not the most complicated case in Canadian history. And I would imagine that they'll that the judge will come back with something, and I would be, I would be pretty, I don't know, I'm pretty disappointed if it took any longer than six months. So I don't think it will. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't. Um, all right, so the trial is over. Uh, we yes. just have the, to pay the pay the final bills, which are substantial. <laughs> um, but yeah. uh, you're off. Yeah, but uh, but we're 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 there. All right, next thing. Yeah. Uh, this is big news in Canada. Uh, the new Bill C-21 amendments, the Liberals have come out with some amendments to replace 
the previous amendments that they withdrew, which were uh, G4 and G46, the mm -hmm. massive long uh, prohibition list, and the all semi-autos with detachable magazines kind of thing. Right. Um, and I think, so there's, there's a bit of stuff to go through, and I think probably the most organized way is you have a list of just kind of, um, you know, just descriptions of the, of the measures that they're bringing forward. Why don't you just run through that list, and then we'll just talk about a couple of them. Okay, so in the new amendments, they're going to ensure new guns receive their FRT number prior to being sold. I'm not aware of that actually being a problem, but <clears throat> um, they're going to call for the permanent alteration of long gun mags to limit to five. Now, that's not going to be in the amendments. It'll come later by regulation. They're going to ban the sales on mags that can hold more than five. They're going to reinstate CFAC, Canadian Firearms Advisory Committee, they're going to prohibit ghost guns, which actually happened yesterday at time of taping um, in committee. So that's already passed. Define, regulate, um, define and regulate essential components. That's part of that ghost gun package, which passed yesterday, uh, which basically just means you'll need a license to order essential parts to build a gun. Um, there's an indigenous rights statement in there, which is more or less meaningless, but it's just acknowledging that um, indigenous Hunters do have a right to um, to hunt. And they're going to review the definition itself, which I have here, in five years. And then the big definition part, which is the replacement for G4, <clears throat> is basically a ban on new semi-auto center fire with detachable mags that hold six or more, but are made after C21 receives royal assent, meaning... Everything that you have now legal stays legal pending decisions by the new CFAC. Yeah. So that's well, the that's, list. That's sort of the operative part. So the intent is, mm -hmm. um, is that any new design, newly designed and manufactured firearms after C21 receives royal assent, if it keeps going on its, on its current trajectory, that could be sometime in the fall, uh, hopefully, yeah. or hopefully at the end of the year, if, if anything. Um, but basically... Any new firearms that come onto the market, they'll be prohibited if they meet these characteristics and all of those characteristics. Yeah, so they have to meet all the criteria, not one or the other, but all of those. Except um, as the liberal government reforms the Canadian uh, Firearms Advisory Committee, what, they, what the government has said they're going to do is they're going to have the committee determine, look at all the firearms that don't meet that criteria to be automatically prohibited and they'll come up with a report of all the guns they think should be prohibited. And then the government will prohibit them using orders in council like they did in May 2020. Now you now you're sort of seeing like, oh, why is it why, why was the Crown Council so so worried? Because they're like, this yeah. was the Liberals' plan was to continue to use the OIC. And now they're like, ooh, we're not sure if we can do that. So mm. it's pretty funny because you might think, well, that means all our uh, all of our guns that we have right now are safe. Everything's fine, just future guns, but I can live with what I got. But no, it's actually probably worse because they're That's saying worse. we're going to let this committee, we're just going to let them tell us what needs to be banned. We'll ban it by OIC. So it's actually yeah. worse. So anyway, we've got a clip just to so you can hear it in Marco Menachino's own words. So check this out. Now, of course, there's more work to be done. That's why we will be reconstituting the Canadian Firearms Advisory Committee to provide expert, nonpartisan advice to the government on how we classify firearms. Comme vous le savez, with a diverse membership, the Advisory Committee will be charged with making independent recommendations about the classification of existing guns in the market. It will include voices from rural and northern communities, indigenous peoples, industry leaders, law enforcement, and gun control advocates, and more. Guided by the committee's recommendation, we will increase the classification of firearms or ban them through an order in council, just as we did in 2020. This committee will be convened quickly and asked to provide its advice to the government as soon as this summer. It will depoliticize the process but, and allow us to cut through misinformation and disinformation and help us to build a strong consensus about how we can move forward. All right. So there you have Marco Mendicino saying flat out, we're going to be 
bringing out OICs and banning guns based on the committee that we determine who the members are. And just in case you didn't hear it, it is voices from rural and northern communities, not gun owners, just voices. We don't know who the voices come from. Indigenous people, that's fine. Industry leaders, okay, of what industry, I guess. Law enforcement and gun control advocates um, and yeah. many more. So it's funny, I did a radio interview this morning and you know the 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 uh, the host is like, well, you know, you're going to have a seat on there. I mean, you're you you represent gun owners, the act, actual gun owners. And I'm like, well, you didn't say that. And he says, well, you said and men, and more. And I'm like, well, maybe yeah, maybe we're lumped in with and more, but <laughs> yeah. but he sure went out of his way to say law enforcement yeah. and and uh, uh, and gun control advocates. So you know, I, this 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 probably could go farther than G4 and G46. Oh, yeah, I absolutely think so, because he's not limiting them to choosing guns that fit a certain criteria or have certain characteristics. It's like, hey, so what do you guys want to ban? Yeah, they're not limited. That's where we're at. Yeah, they're not constrained by anything other than their opinion. No, so that's that this is actually far worse than what we had before. Um, Just maybe prolonged a little bit because then they can say, well, it's not us banning those guns. CFAC chose them. You know, and dropping regulations on the heads of gun owners sitting here. How do we even keep track of what's legal and what's not? It's well, it's insanity. And I'll and and I'll tell you another reason why he decided to go this route is because he thinks you are all stupid. He thinks he thinks everyone is so stupid. They'd be like, oh, you're not going to ban any of our old guns. Awesome. And then also it's like, well, who are these CFAC people? They're a bunch of gun control people. Oh, you're banning because of you're banning my guns that I have now. You know, oh, you know, it was the old switcheroo. I fell for it again. <laughs> it was just, yeah. Man, these I people. don't think gun owners are, are stupid. I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll help them to, to show exactly what's going on here. But this is, there is no way that this sort of retreat is permanent by any means. This is just like, hey, we're going to pull back, take the heat off of us. Everyone can blame it on CFAC and we'll still get whatever we want. They can ban anything they want. Yeah, and and the gun control groups, they they don't care whether you know you you're upset with them. They don't care. No, they'll just they ban everything. They'll just take they'll take everything from you. They couldn't care less. So, no. anyway, they made that very obvious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So on to the next thing. Probably the most sensitive thing um, is the CSAAA facilitating a liberal government buyback of so-called assault style firearms, assault style weapons uh, from retailers, importers, and distributors in Canada. Now, I think Tracy and I spoke about this and I and and we figured that the most efficient way to to do this, to discuss this, is I'm gonna give you some thoughts and then she's gonna give you her thoughts. And that's what you're gonna get from the CCFR. And the reason for that is it's not up to the CCFR to dictate to the CSAAA what, you know, what they should be doing. It's that's a relationship between the members, the people that pay the CSAAA to exist, and the leadership of the CSAAA. Those are the the members are who they're accountable to, not to the CCFR. So we're going to discuss it, um, and we're going to let you draw your own conclusions. So having said that, um, so th- there's a few questions floating around, and I'm going to answer a couple of those and then provide some thoughts. So first thing um, I would say is, for me, uh, this whole thing is quite complicated because three years ago, the Liberal government um, banned all these guns with no notice whatsoever. All the retailers are standing there going like, um, I've got 50, 100,000, 300,000, half a million dollars, whatever it is, it's, and it varies obviously widely, uh, worth of inventory. And all of a sudden, I'm st- I can't move it. I can't sell it. I can't get my money back for it, whatever. Trudeau says, okay, well, we're going to get a buyback as soon as possible because all these good people, they didn't do anything to deserve this, apparently. And so we'll get a buyback rolling as soon as possible, you know, within the coming whatever, months. And of course, he didn't mean that at all. They hadn't looked into it whatsoever and found out that it's a very difficult thing to do. They didn't care. They seized the opportunity. And now three years later, you have, um, I think probably the worst part is small businesses, businesses where people are like, you know what, let's retire, let's take our money, we'll invest it, we'll we'll open a gun shop and we'll get licensed and we'll do everything the right way and this it's this is our dream and maybe someday this business will be worth enough that we can sell it and then we can stop working. Well, people like that are sitting there now with who knows how much inventory that they couldn't sell. 
they are they have lost that money that they can't use to buy other inventory that was legal to sell and they're probably a lot of the in a lot of these situations people don't own their inventory they're financing it they're using a business line of credit for i don't know 7 8 12% who knows to finance that stuff so they actually owe money for this which they're paying interest and of course insurance and storage and all this stuff 3 years later so some of these people are probably on the brink of bankruptcy. Some probably already have gone out of business and lost everything. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, it's not, so I guess the reason of, the reason I'm painting that scenario is it's not up to me to tell those people that they need to hang on or just go bankrupt so that I can stay ideologically pure because I don't think anybody should be, you know, cooperating with the liberals at any level. Like it's just, it's just not for me to do that. And I'm, I'm not living their life. I'm my. I'm not walking in their shoes. So to me, it's a little bit. I guess in my in in my opinion, a little bit narcissistic to think that they should be obligated to me to determine what to do in their own life. So I don't know. It's 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 complicated. Now the CSAAA, for their own reasons, has decided. You know, they're going to get in on this action, and they're going to be the go between. And so. When did so some people have asked, when did we know and what did we know? And the answer to that is the Friday before the Monday when all this came out, when when Marco Mendicino actually released this information, I was contacted by the CS AAA. And it was it was basically said to me, we've entered into an agreement to facilitate a buyback for the businesses that need or want to sell those those uh, firearms to the government to get rid of that unsellable inventory. And we're going to facilitate that part. And it's, and it's data gathering uh, was what it was, you know, as a service to our members. And I said, okay, fair enough. You know, that's that's everyone's own pro um, prerogative to do that. And um, and that, that was it. And the reason why the CSAAA was calling us was, you know, we may face backlash. Would you explain it to your members if they need extra explanation other than from us? Because it may may look bad. Right. And, and I said, well, yeah, because the way that it's being portrayed to me is reasonable. And yeah. And, and everything I just said, right, was the reason why I said that's fine. And so when this came out, it wasn't the CSAAA coming out with it or it wasn't this, the CSAAA members or some kind of conversation or video or whatever. It was Marco Mendicino rolling out at a press conference, getting all kinds of credibility that he's now partnered with the firearms community because everybody's on the same page and want this buyback to happen. So he, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to expose what the government is actually doing. And now he is trying, what he's done is he's got entered into this agreement and achieved a bunch of credibility, like we're all working with them. And that's not true. So that wasn't represented. And then later that day, we found out that um, they were getting paid for all this, that somehow they're going to, they're, they stand to make over seven hundred thousand dollars doing this, and then, then that just got really complicated. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know what? Uh, we, you know, I felt like okay, the 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 rollout of this was mishandled. Um, I'm not sure whether I would go as far as to say maybe the liberals uh, pulled one over um, on the CS I don't, I don't know, but I don't have all the information. For one, I clearly didn't. We didn't. I don't think as a community we did. And I don't feel good um, getting involved in that and helping them, I guess, at that point. So I told Tracy to pull her video down that she made and pull down all our posts because the whole thing was sort of moving sideways. And at the end of the day, this is the CSAAA's mess and this is the liberal government. I mean, if I were to say one thing to defend them, it is a liberal government's mess, 100%. But the CSAAA have gotten kind of into into an agreement with the government and it's their mess. It's not It's not the CCFR's mess and, that, and that's why I don't want to answer for them. Um, at the same time, I don't want to hurt them because that's not our role either. Uh, we have enough division in our, in our community and that division does not help us. So anyway, that's why we stayed quiet and more and more information keeps leaking out about this and Tracy's going to talk about it in a second, but um, that's one of the reasons why I think in situations like this, I don't run out and try to get ahead of things. I wait and I see, and I wait for all the information to emerge so that we can make, um, a reasonable statement on these things. So we're not making an official statement, but these are some of the things that are our opinion. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to let Tracy talk for a bit. 
Yeah, so it is a very complicated, difficult issue to discuss. But um, as you said, this was a Monday morning announcement. You were contacted on Friday. I found out on the Sunday night that there would be an announcement the following morning. And it was presented to me like, you know, this is just a compensation program for retailers, unsellable inventory. And of course, watching the press conference, it was, you know, painfully clear that it was a little more than that. You're right. Later that day, we did find out that it was a paid contract. And of course, the CSAAA, it's sort of message that they had um, spoken to or consulted with the other firearms organizations. And we were all good with this. And that's not entirely true. I don't consider finding out the night before that there's announcement the following morning, let alone not having any of the details of the contract or the idea that they were getting paid. So, you know, it's hard to give an opinion on something when you have zero information about it. Now, up until today, we also didn't have any details of the contract or how the pay would work or anything like that until now. So I um, do have a copy of the contract. I've seen it circulating around. It has been uh, has been made public by the Liberal government. Um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff in there that is concerning to me. And in particular, um, one of the deliverables that the CSAAA signed off on, on this contract that they are obligated to do, and that is to provide details on unresponsive businesses as part of the inventory report in compliance with their task. And this will be done biweekly. So what that means is they are to facilitate this. They've identified 2,600 firearm retailers that will be captured by this. There's also sort of a commissioned-based pay that is sort of a bit of a problem for me. So the more stores the CSAAA is able to get to participate, the more they'll get paid. <clears throat> for those stores, stores that don't participate or are unresponsive or are not compliant, they are to report those stores to the federal government. That's a problem for me because of my, my idea is that these retailers should be protected. And we do have a pending decision out of the federal court on that gun ban to begin with. And then finally, um, part of their contract is also to uh, verify destruction in accordance with the Firearms Act. So when you say a firearm is destroyed, there's a, an actual legal definition of destroying a firearm. And of course, that's so that it can never be used again, right? And they are to provide all that information as well. So it's not just data collecting. It's, um, you know, it, it's kind of a consignment commission based thing going on. And the part that really I struggle with is the reporting of unresponsive or um, uncompliant businesses. So I yeah, again, I mean, I, you know, I can't I'm not here to beat them up or condemn what they've done. But at the same time, I cannot defend this. So you know, this isn't um, this isn't our idea of how we fight these gun bans. I think the CCFR stance on these gun bans is painfully clear because we've just spent two and a half years and well over two million dollars in the federal court fighting these, and we've got the receipts. And yeah, I, I would not be in a position to um, to willfully aid the government in their efforts at this time. Yeah. So, you know. Um so I guess I guess in summary, the if if anyone is, was going to negotiate pricing, and and be a go between between you know all the retailers and distributors and importers in Canada and the federal government, it would be the CSAAA. That's their the industry representative group. Um, the the government could have, and you said this, Tracy. The government could have just made a portal. And had yeah. had retailers voluntarily go to the portal and and upload their their uh, invoices for all of their inventory and get paid directly. They didn't really need the CS AAA. Um, no, the <laughs> the organization uh, had said that the consumer groups, I guess, is what they call us, were consulted. We weren't consulted. We were informed a few days before uh, that and informed just that. Oh yeah, we were gonna we're gonna be facilitating something. We didn't know they were getting paid. We didn't know that they were going to be reporting unresponsive businesses. Uh, we didn't know they were going to get commission for however many business, however you know many firearms that they're going to um, get, you know, get back or have destroyed. We didn't know they were going to confirm destruction. 
So it was it was represented even in there was a little a little round table after to kind of clear the air between the CSAAA and a bunch of industry people and, and ourselves and whatnot. And, you know, it was again represented even after it blew up as, oh, we're just doing data collection. And it's like, well, no, now that we no, looked at not. this agreement, it's start to finish, even verifying destruction. Yeah. It's f f yeah. facilitating the buyback. Yeah, it is. And it, and it, I, it really I, is. And and let me reiterate, we are not interested in hurting the CSAAA. We're not interested in getting involved in their business. Um, we The CCFR does what we do. We're not interested in... in hurting or getting involved uh, in things of other firearm organizations or wildlife groups or anything like that, right? We just, we, we do our thing and that's it. But um, but yeah, so I, I think all that to say, draw your own conclusions. Um, if you're a member of the CSAAA, you know, now you have the information from our side as far as we know, we don't know everything, but that's this is what we know and this is how it went down. And, you know, you can, uh, you can make your own decisions there. So we, we just wanted to have this conversation to let you know exactly what was going on, and that's about the best we can do. We're not going to be putting out an official statement because it's not it's not our circus. It's between mm -hmm. the CSAAA and its members and the public if they have an opinion about what they're doing and the liberal government. Their uh, their uh, inter in interlocutors of the <laughs> of the agreement itself. So yeah, and. I'll just one final note to there um, on the CSAAA board themselves, all four members of the board who represented retailers, because of course they represent retailers, distributors, and manufacturers, all four retailer board members of the CSAAA have resigned. So yeah, that's what's going on. So again, that's that's just the facts as, as far as we have, and that's the information we have. Draw your own conclusions, but that's uh, it is what it is. Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> National Range Day is coming up, by the way, yeah. on uh, June the third, which is great. I'm um, excited. Yeah. I don't. We were having a problem with uh, with the the website tool, the um, event locator. Hopefully, that's fixed. I'm not sure whether that. I think it is because I've seen. I do get an email every time somebody registers their event on there. Um, so I, I have seen it operating. If you have a link like a Facebook link or maybe a link to your website for your club's national range day, and you want us to promote it, send it to me personally at tracy.wilson at ccfr.ca. I'll splash it all over the socials and promote it for you. And yeah, uh, you can check out all the events will be posted on our social media if we have them. So send them to us register your event or just take somebody shooting. Absolutely. And one more thing on, on uh, national range day, uh, this time around the CCFR did not hire a full-time person like we did last year to call all of the other organizations, the wildlife federations, um, industry partners, all these people, like we hire somebody full-time mm -hmm. to promote this, call people on the phone to say, how are you participating? Are you, and how are you going to yeah. participate? We didn't do that this time because we had a lot of other things uh, going on. So uh, National Range Day is, you know, basically on cruise control this year. So hopefully everyone has done their part and told their range to hold an open house and registered on the website so that we can take people shooting. So that's really important. Um, Absolutely. Well, hopefully next year it won't be as busy and there won't be so many bad gun bills coming down the, uh, down, coming down the pipe at us, right? So we can spend more time at National Range Day. Um, there was, oh yeah, and, and the AGM. So the AGM yeah. is uh, is going to be in a month from now if you're watching the podcast. And uh, don't forget to grab tickets as soon as possible. It's going to be a great time and uh, you won't want to miss it. We don't know if we can ever do something like this again, uh, but uh, we've set the stage for a grand party for all gun owners. So go to the uh, go to the website, ccfr.ca or firearmrights.ca and make sure that you, uh, you get your tickets while they last. We'll be there and we'll be partying uh, along with you. Big speakers. Absolutely. Yeah, everything's on the website. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, you know what? I'm going to add one more thing about the okay. exceedingly uncomfortable conversation about the CSAAA because it just popped into my head. We had a retailer contact us and say, hey, you know what I did with my stuff is um, they parted out all of those firearms and, yeah. sold, and sold the parts. So that that way they weren't out all the money. They recovered their money and then just saved the upper and lower receiver to turn into the government because that was the prohibited part. Right. So, That's smart. Yeah. 
So we may have some more details on on that, but uh, that was another way that um, that retailers could have been made whole uh, of their own volition, and they didn't have to participate in any, in any of this other stuff. So, mm-hmm. all right, did we cover everything? I think that's it. <laughs> that's a lot. It was yeah, oh, it was a long one. Thanks just- for hanging in there with us. And um, yeah. Anyway, all right. Thanks for the update, Ms. Wilson, and we will uh, we'll see you next time. All right, we'll see you then. All right, that's going to do it for this episode, episode 142 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. That's a lot of episodes, man. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's going to do it. But as I mentioned in the uh, monologue in the intro, <clears throat> I'm going to answer the question, why does anyone need an AR-15? And I'm actually just going to read it for you and so that maybe you can listen to it a couple of times, internalize the concept so that you can answer this question because not everybody that asks it is malicious. They, When someone asks... You know, why do you need an AR-15? There's actually two questions going on in there. So I'm breaking them apart so that you can answer them. Okay, so I'm just going to read this verbatim so that I'm not editorializing and wasting your time. Okay, so there's really two parts to that answer. One is why do people own AR-15s? Okay, because that is that is part of it. And the other is addressing why people need them as it were. So the almost the rhetorical question. Canadians own AR-15 specifically for sport shooting. It is the de facto long gun for many types of sport shooting events. There are a lot of people involved in these activities, and they've been going on for over 100 years in this country. None of this is new. Okay, so we use AR-15s for sport shooting. They are essential for sport shooting. Like, everybody uses them. Okay, so that's that's the reason. And we've had AR-15s since the 1960s in Canada, and we've been involved in sport shooting for over 100 years in Canada with semi-autos, by the way, okay? Or recreational shooting, if you want to call it that. Concerning the need part of the question, there's a lot of things that Canadians can own without having to demonstrate a need. So the need argument, it doesn't exist. Now, that is a replacement for the real questions, okay? The real question is that you need to, that you should be asking, is public safety negatively impacted by Canadians owning certain kinds of firearms? And would a ban on certain types of firearms make Canadians safer? Those are the real questions. And just as important, is the response, gun bans, right? So confiscation of property from people that have proven they can be trusted with this property, is the response justified by the potential public safety benefit? Though That's the real calculus right there. Those are your three real questions that any serious person should be asking. Now, those are the real questions. And I understand that it's a lot more convenient to replace the hard questions that have hard solutions, by the way, with why does anyone need an AR-15? So for anyone who wants to be taken seriously on the topic of public safety, these are the questions that we should be asking. And again, so here's some more. And again, for those who are serious people, there are other very serious questions that need to be answered, like where's the violence really coming from in Canada? Who's doing it? How do we stop violent behavior in the first place with or without firearms? Or where are these guns coming from? Another serious question. Where are the guns really coming from? Because in Canada, we actually don't really know. So, you know, there's, there's some figures from some jurisdictions, but not across the country, and they're not consistent. Are there things that we can do to keep firearms out of the hands of criminals that don't include taking firearms away from millions of Canadians who have done nothing wrong? Have we even talked about that? Like in Bill C, C, uh, C21 or C71 or any of the other stuff. Have we, even, have we even talked about it? I don't know. These things are difficult. That's why you don't see the bloc, the NDP, or the liberals doing them or asking any of these hard questions. So hopefully that helps. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, cut and paste this response into the description box so you can have it just without my editorializing. I was going to try not to editorialize, but I'm trying to trying to make it just help people follow the thought process so you can kind of internalize it. So you might be able to be in a position where you could actually roll that out on demand because that's really the answer. Canadians own them for good and sufficient reasons, and we don't demonstrate need for anything else in our society. And... If you're, if you're the question, the reason why you're asking the question is because you're concerned about public safety, here are the questions you should be asking and the things you should be thinking about 
if you are truly and genuinely concerned about public safety. So anyway, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I think I talked about it with Tracy, but the AGM tickets, get them while they're hot. I don't know if this will ever happen again. This could be a one-off. So come party with us in, uh, in Ottawa in June. And uh, don't forget National Range Day as well. Okay, nationalrangeday.ca. Make sure your range is doing something. If you miss this year, because uh, as we mentioned with Tracy, we didn't hire somebody to call around for like four weeks straight, just making phone calls to try to get people involved. Um, it wasn't cheap and it was a lot of work. So uh, we didn't do it this year because we had too much going on. So if your club is missing this year, then start talking about it for next year. This is the, this is the number one way to get people to understand why people own guns and to be able to answer questions like that on their own without you having to tell them. Okay, take people shooting. Anyway, all right. Thanks so much for watching. Share the podcast. We really appreciate it. If you want to become a member of the CCFR or donate, you can do that at firearmrights.ca or ccfr.ca. Thanks, everyone. Take care, and we'll see you in the next one. This is another episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca.